Yeah, so happy 2021. Um, I'm very excited to introduce this new series of talks for the Vantage Seminar this spring. Uh, they will be on K3, service, uh, K3 surfaces, and we have a, a wonderful series of speakers lined up. And we're going to start today with Edgar Costa, who will be talking about K3 surfaces from counting points to rational curves. Uh, and Edgar, is it okay for us to record this talk? Yes, it is. Okay, take it away. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak at Vantage. Uh, it's been a great entertainment over the last year and a half, more or less. Okay, so let me start with a, already jump a bit, about a bit about K-free surface and its name. So uh, its name is given to, to Coomer, Kaler, and Kodair, and also to the K2 mountain. And perhaps the best way to describe it is in a quote from Andrew Vale that says, uh, I'll, I'll translate on the fly, is the same, saying something along the lines. In the second part of my report, we'll deal with Kaler varieties known as K3, named in honor of Coomer, Kaler, and Kodaira, and of the beautiful mountain K2 in Kashmir. And the mountain K2 is not just by from its beauty, but also by its difficulty, which talks a little bit about K3 surface. It's like challenging, doable, but not so easy to climb it up. And for example, only like 10 days ago, it was just first winter ascent, and it was basically the only peak above 8,000 meters that remained to do so. And it's not like because people didn't try in the past, they tried many times and several times, and all the times they tried before they failed. Okay, so let's move up now to math. Um, first thing I need to start with what is what's a K-free surface. Um, there are several equivalent ways to define K-free surface. In the end of the day, basically, we're trying to cut down the right surface that we want. So I'll just give you my definition. And my definition will play a very, very, very small role in my talk, so don't take it personally. But I define a K3 surface as an algebraic uh, surface that is smooth, projective. So, so far, things we expect, simply connected. In some way, I'm just trying to say that I don't want to be on surface and we trivial canonical class. And now when you look at this definition, you'll think, if I weaken one of these conditions, what do I get? And we'll see that you get familiar objects. As I said, if you can take away the simply connected, you'll get, you allow a billion surface, for example. If you reduce the dimension, you get something that looks like, lip, not something that looks like the curve, you get elliptic curves. So you're really trying to make something that's familiar, but new at the same time. Um, so the easiest example to, to give of a KP surface is a smooth quartic in P3. And any smooth quartic will do. For example, you can take the Fermat quartic surface, which is plays a very similar role to the Fermat curves for curves. Now, if you are a person that really loves like hyperlytic evolutions, or you think about curves like hyperlytic curves, we also have a model like that. We have double covers of P2, branch over sexy curve. Uh, so it comes with a natural evolution. So this is another model for a KFI surface. And if you really miss the group structure and you really like, that's why you like uh, abelian varieties, we can also create one with, with a, via abelian surface. And those are known as Coomer surface. So what do I do is that I have an abelian surface. I quotient by the plus or minus one. I got 16, 16 singular points. I resolve those singularities and then I get a KFI surface. But the point here is that I could keep going on like um, about other possible models for KFR surface, but you should pick a model, the one you prefer, and stick that in your mind for the rest of the talk. Like just pick your favorite and move along, because I'm not going to try to classify all the possible KFR surfaces, so just trying to give you an idea what are KFR surface. And obviously, uh, the other more generic examples are basically go higher projective spaces and you now co consider complete intersections. But okay, I'll give you the definition. Now is uh, quite dry. So the next question is, why do we care about K3 surface? And why do we care is, is a bit hard to, to answer, but maybe the simplest reason is because they really land like a nice spot in a classification of, of surface. So if you try to classify your surface according to some complexity, for example, Kodaira dimension, they really land in the middle. So they are not too hard to understand, but also not trivial to understand, even though that things that come before them are not trivial at all, but 
this provides new challenges. Um, well, and a way you can think about is that um, K-free service can be considered the, the simple task right variety whose structure does not reduce back to curves or even varieties. So in this way, you give me more variety, sorry, variety now in terms of diversity, but you still can, you can still produce something uh, like, sorry, you can still produce some understanding regarding them without going to the total generic case. Despite that, they still share a lot of things with curves and middle varieties. So they provide new challenge, but they also give you some familiarity when it comes to understanding the problem that you're trying to address. Um, so now here's some features of the K-free surface that you might want to know about. Obviously, I could just do all lecture about it, but I'll just try to give some of them. The first one is, by my definition, they have trivial canonical bundle. This just means in more generic terms that they're Calvi manifold, as is the case for elliptic curves. And in our case, Calvi is thinking about in a way that it's relevant to physics. And because of that, from physics, we can bring a lot of insights. So by the way, it's relevant to physics because in the in string theory world somewhat explains how universe behaves. So here are some of the things that we can get from physics. One of them is mirror symmetry. I'm not an expert in mirror symmetry, but the way I think about this is a duality. And the way you can think about it is that things, uh, sorry, a two K-free surface which have a common mirror will share arithmetic properties. For example, we know some examples of that, that for example, when you have two K-free surfaces that are mirror, they'll, for example, share the interesting part of the L polynomial. Uh, other things they can bring from physics is some interesting heuristics. For example, Yao and Zalo, you have the curve counting heuristics for uh, the number of fractional curves in a K-free surface. They did this by counting some BPS states. I really don't understand what does that, that is about, but later on, people will manage to formalize the this heuristic. But the interesting part here is that we have an heuristic why it first tells that there are infinitely many rational curves in a K free surface as these numbers dn keep growing. And where this delta here is the unique uh, weight 12 cus form with level one. So it's, you can see there's some really uh, rather connection between geometry and the mercury. Now, going away from the world of physics, we can talk about some mathematical statements. We have a, a Torel theorem. So by this, we mean this is just like in case of curves, that in case of a curve, you have that a curve is determined by its, uh, Jacobian. And here's exactly the same statement saying that a K free surface is determined by its odd structure. So it allows us to understand very well the, the period map of a K free surface, for example. Um, an interesting construction regarding K free surface to something that we understand very well, which is the given varieties, is the Kuga Satake construction. Now, this might be a bit scary as at, at the first glance, so let's go this slowly. So this relates a, a K-free surface X to a building variety we shall call KSX of dimension up to to the 19. So first, let's ignore the dimension. Let's focus on what, what the statement says. The statement says that as odd structures, my odd structure set to H2 of X will be a substructure of my H2 of the abelian variety to the square. So this is telling that the ostracks are related to abelian varieties. And first thing before we get a bit overwhelmed with this dimension count, we should just ask ourselves what happens in the case that we understand well, for example, Kummer surface. So I knew I started with a abelian surface and I did my quotient and then singularize it. So what happens in that case? So what's the, what's the kuga sataka variety of that k surface? In that case, it's just the, the original abelian variety to the eighth power or sorry, it's as large as to that one. And indeed that's the case for many things we understand and that's what you expect. So this two to 19 should not scare you away because the construction must have, must allow abelian varieties of at most this dimension, but in the end of the day, we expect these abelian varieties to have a lot of structure. But the upshot here is that this allows us to uh, push forward theorems from abelian varieties to k surface. And that's the, how we should see it. Like we cannot yet construct Kuga Sataka varieties on demand, but just having the idea that there's an amino right out there in the world allows us to, to prove cert certain theories about Kefir surface, which were first known how to prove in abelian varieties. So again, there's some familiarity when you're trying to prove something, 
we should start by is it holds on, on billion varieties or it holds on Kummer surface and then try to prove it for KP surface. Okay, now let me switch a bit of gears. Um, let's now go to finite fields. In finite fields, when we're looking at binary varieties, for example, we have the Honda take theory that tells us exactly what L polynomials or from minus polynomials can arise. And for the KP service, we understand what L polynomials can arise, but the Honda take theory tells a bit more. It tells that if that polynomial, if that polynomial arises, then indeed there's a billion variety that gives, uh, gives rise to it. And here the analogy is a bit weaker, is that we know after a base change, we'll be able to realize such polynomial. So let me say that correctly, that there's a, a base change that if you do to that polynomial, that will match your k-free service. So basically you lose control of the field of definition. It's a bit sad, but hopefully in a couple of years, we'll, we can, I can take away the weaker word and still say we have a take theory for k-free surface. And along the same lines, uh, very recently, now we have a, a categorical description of ordinary k service over a finite field. What I mean by this is I mean that we have a categorical description in terms of linear algebra data over Z. So this is very similar to what the Lin did for ordinary billion varieties over a finite field. So if you want to understand a billion surface, uh, sorry, k surface up to isogeny, or sorry, up to isomorphism, you can just go to this linear algebra approach and you'll be able to construct them. However, at the end of the day, it's very hard then to make equations back. Uh, that's also the case for abelian varieties. Okay, so now I give you some random facts about k surface. Now I shall tell you what problems we care about. And I'll just give you some list of popular problems. And perhaps the simplest one is existence of rational points. Uh, so if you think a bit about the example I gave you initially, I give you the Fermat uh, quartic, and you should ask yourself, why I should I expect that equation that looks very much like the Fermat's last theorem, but now with an extra variable, to have any solution? Indeed, Euler, many years ago, had that conjecture. Had, he, had, he had given a generalized, uh, sorry, conjecture the generalization of Fermat's last theorem, and he claimed that this equation should not have solutions. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Noam Elkins showed that indeed Euler was wrong and indeed this solution has infinitely many solutions. This, sorry, this equation has infinitely many rational points. Okay, and in some ways we look at this equation. Yeah, as arithmetic geometry, we clearly understand that the moving double to the other side uh, will give to a minus and perhaps we're just lucky. Perhaps this equation has a lot of symmetry and we expect if you break the symmetry a bit, we'll not find any solution. And Sweeten and Dyer need a similar conjecture. Now for something very similar to the Fermat quartic again, and also he also conjectured that it should not have any solutions in the reals, sorry, in the rationals. And indeed, uh, we managed to find a solution whether Elson and Yano found a unique solution uh, with below 100 million, where the solution is this one, which again gives an, a, another counter example of the idea that we should not have rational, rational points on this kind of, of surface. And is there a trend here? I don't know. But you can see now, this one was quite hard to find. And I don't, I don't remember at what time, how much time it took, but you should compare this analogy of trying to write, for example, a small number as number of cubes. So it's more or less the same thing. You're trying to, you really need to see through all the possible numbers and try to find such a solution. So it's, if it's hard to find rational points for curves, here is harder in the sense that you have more variables to consider now. Okay, maybe I don't have rational solutions. Maybe I want to think about what happens when I change my base field. Or I want to think about if I have rational points, do I have a lot of them or not? So uh, one thing we can ask ourselves like about the risk density of my rational points or potential density, which means when I do a base change and I can give you uh, a statement from Baumol and Schinkel that tells us that if X as an extra structure, for example, as an elliptic vibration, an elliptic vibration or the autonomous group is infinite, then the rational points are positively dense, or sorry, potentially dense, which means that uh, indeed we should expect to have a lot of rational points. At least that's how I understand it. Now, I've been so far I've been talking about points, but if you think back to curves and user generalization, 
points are one possible generalization, but as a another possible generalization is to ask for curves. So I can ask about existence of rational curves. And for example, can you think about this, for example, if I can find many lines, then I can create many uh, curves with many rational points. Indeed, Noam Elkins is famous for this, this kind of trick and producing uh, curves with a lot of points. For example, if you start with a, uh, a quartic curve, sorry, quartic surface, you can get a quartic curve of genus three. And if you start with a double, a, a double cover P2, then you get the hyperlytic curve of genus two. And for example, he, uh, as far as he knows, he has two records. One is like as a quartic surface, he has record of 46 lines defined over Q. And for double cover, the record is 53 lines. So it means if you start uh, when in one of these surface and then you intersect with the upper plane, then you're guaranteed to get at least 46 or 53 points. And then if you're smart about your upper plane, as Noam has shown us, that's quite, quite good at it, you can produce even more points. And now I want to state another theorem of Bowman Schinkel, which plays as exactly the same shape as before, is that tells that under the same conditions as before. So these are exactly the same conditions as I wrote here. Then we have infinitely many rational curves. So there's somewhat connection between potential density and infinitely many rational curves. And so we would like to understand when our X as is at the structure, for example, or when you indeed have infinitely many rational curves without any assumption. So now I'll give you, for example, the, the example of one example of the example of norm. This is not the record surface, but this one has 42 lines. And also the picture was provided by norm itself. Uh, now let me keep going on the popular problems. Um, another popular problem is to understand obstruction of assets local goal principle. I suspect we'll hear much more about this in the, in the future. But the idea is that the Hassel uh, local goal principle is known to fail under certain assumptions, but we don't yet have a full picture why it fails or what are the reasons to fail. But usually, the Barrow group, the Barrow group plays a, a key role to explain such uh, obstructions. Not just only Brown remaining obstruction, but there are other kind of obstructions that we're aware of. And if you don't know what the Brower group is, one way to think about it, you can think about it as a Tate-Shaver H group of an elliptic curve. Another alternative, which is uh, more popular with their point of view is that you can also think about the distortion analytic curve, but I'll not discuss that more. I also think that we'll hear about that more in the future. Uh, as we can see before, understanding automorphism groups of a uh, surface might be important for us. So we might just want to ask ourselves what automorphism groups can, can be out there for a k surface and can you classify them? So such an example, for example, is by Mukai is that it tells us that if I have uh, my autofensive group is finite, then my autofensive group being inside of the most group 23 is equivalent to inducing a faithful and sympathetic, sympathetic action. And for last, uh, maybe as natural as for every other example that you can imagine, we want compute geometric invariants. Heavy uh, surfaces have a lot of variability, what things can arise as, for example, as automorphism groups or a period map or bar a bar group or Picard lattice. So we want to compute these things. And these are interestingly correlated. For example, if I know something about my automorphism group, then all of that will help me down with Picard lattice. If I want to compute the Brow group or as a Galois model, then I first need to start with a Picard lattice. Maybe I have no way to compute the Picard lattice. So perhaps I start with the period map and then try to help me to compute the Picard lattice. So all these things are, are correlated. And because they really sit on the next level of difficulty after rule surface, none of these objects that are trivial to compute. So now I think now is a good point for me to stop and ask for questions. Uh, I noticed that Noam says a couple of years ago was more than 30 years ago, but sorry, Noam, for me, that's still like, it's basically when I learned it. Okay, is there any questions? Please let me know. I'll wait for 30 seconds. And also, if at any time you feel that you have a question or I said, or you want to interrupt me, just interrupt me. I'm open to that. I prefer to have a conversation than me speaking to Zoom for one hour. Well, thanks, Edgar. I, I really enjoyed this introduction with all these problems that are open. Okay, I'll move along. 
Uh, what? Uh, Raymond von Bommel. Uh, yes, what do I mean by new faithful sympathetic action? Um, there's no reason for an automatic group to not induce to induce sympathetic action or not. So basically, I'm I'm just saying that. Um, what am I saying? Is it maybe the question is is your problem with faithful or is your problem sympathetic? I mean, on what? Oh, on the curve on uh, on the odd structure. That's where we measure sympathetic of the action. Uh, and not to say, which I, I forgot to act, um, LSNSRT, who's going to speak in two weeks, will tell us much more about this. So I'm sure we'll, I have a limited understanding of this, of autonomous group on the KP surface. And I'm, I know that she'll tell us much more about this. So I'm, I'm looking forward to learn much more about autonomous group of KP surface. Okay, so for me, my most important invariant at the moment is the Picard lattice of a Kepler surface. That's basically what I focus most of my time to think about. And let me try to tell you a bit more about it. So I claim as a key geometric invariant uh, for an algebraic Kepler surface. Uh, you can think in many ways. So one way you can think about it as a Picard group or as an inner severity group. In the case of a Kepler surface, uh, they are the same because peak zero is trivial. Uh, it's a lattice. At the moment, if you just want to think about this simple, just think about z to the row. And normally, we call row the Picard number. Uh, if you want to think about geometrically, it describes algebraic cycles under your favorite numeric, uh, under your favorite equivalency relation. So the way you can think about it is that if you start with a quartic surface, you pick your favorite type of plane, you intersect it, now you nudge it a bit and intersect it again. So now you got two curves. Is there any reason for you to consider these two curves differently inside of the Kiefer surface? No. So that's what I mean by, uh, in this case, would be numeric equivalence, for example, or algebraic. Anyway, all these relations, all these considerations are the same on a Kiefer surface. So you can pick your favorite one. If this still sounds too abstract to you, maybe it's worth to go down to endomorphisms of abelian varieties. In this case, it's better to just ignore peak and just talk about the nearest survey group. In this case, the nearest survey group can be related to endomorphisms algebra. And it's just the endomorphisms which are fixed under the resulting pollution. So what's the resulting pollution? If your endomorphism algebra is a, is a matrix algebra over a CM field, this resulting pollution is going to be the transposed conjugate. So it's not does not give you the full information about endomorphism, you know, the endomorphism algebra, but give you a lot of information. In other words, you care about Picard lattice as in the way that you care about endomorphism algebra in the building varieties, because when you prove theorems, many times you need to put constraints on the on what your Picard lattice is. For example, when you sometimes prove about theorems about building varieties, say like the ASCM by blah, or A as at least real multiplication. So Picard lattice plays the same role here. And over Q bar or over C, we didn't know what, what it is. You can think about it as an intersection of H11 with H2. And this is a, a very rich lattice structure. And here you can see that it's out of two copies of E8 plus uh, three hyperbolic planes. And OK, let me stop here. What does NS stand for? Uh, NS stands for narrow severity group. And in general, the Nenner Severi group is not in general, it's the short exact sequence is peak over peak zero. Uh, I didn't write here peak over peak zero because I found it confusing, but I hope this helps. But you should think about the only thing you need to worry about. Okay, I'm not going to say more, it's going to complicate more things. But think about that as, as the same at the moment if you don't know the difference between them. Um, and here, where things become more interesting is that uh, this, this rank, so we know could potentially go up to 22. Uh, however, this bit here has dimension 20, so can go up to 20. If I start with algebraic surface, I have the polarization. I have my hyperplane section all the time. So I start at one, and it, every possible value can be taken. And here's where we need to stop and think about 
why Kingfish surfers uh, are interesting is that because if you go back and if you, for example, focus on surface in P3, you can start with things of lower degree. You can start with degree one. So you just get P2. In that case, the Picard lattice is, is, is just that. If you start with you study curves, you study surface of degree two, that's a uh, variation to P1 cross P1. So then, then your Picard lattice is just that square. And if you go to cubic surface, we have Z7. So in those all those examples pre before the Kfish surface, your Picard lattice was a bit boring. So it's not totally boring. There's still like some interesting art interpretation coming to, from it, for example, in the case of the cubic surface. But I know exactly what will be this number. So it's only when we get to Kfish surface that this number can have any variability. Okay, and for last, as we expect, if this plays the same role as the, the enormous algebra for a billion variety, then a generic Kfir surface will have rank one. Furthermore, you should be thinking about this rank or this Picard number, as someone call it, as the degree of difficulty, or sorry, is, is inverse proportional to the degree of difficulty of a Kfir surface. And the way to think about it is that uh, as vector spaces, my H2 split as the, the Picard lattice, now tensor with Q, and the Tx, which I'll call transcendental lattice. I'll not mention it anymore, I hope. And the idea is that anything that's interesting in terms of color representations arises from in a transcendental lattice. So the way to think about it is that these are algebraic cycles. So gala A is going to act here faithfully. So at the end of the day, any representation that arrives from this, this chunk is going to be art in representation uh, with the date twist. So anything new that I'm looking for is going to be arising here. And indeed, for example, if you ask about, for example, modularity is a thing that you're used to ask about elliptic curves. And in the case, we only know, well, better, we only understand modularity uh, in the case of that Tx is very small, or in other words, when the rank is very large. Indeed, I think we fully understand from when rank is 20 and as the rank starts to decrease, things get more complicated. Okay, so if it's an important invariant, can we compute it? Uh, that's my first question. And the answer is more or less. So over finite fields, uh, things become a bit different. So that's where I will start to try to compute it because that's where I can compute it without a, a problem or at least the dimension. Uh, now, magically, now, the, now the, the rank can only, over the FP bar, can only take even numbers and can go all the way to 22. Remember that over Q bar or over C, it was all the numbers up to 20. But this should not surprise you. This is exactly the same thing as with elliptic curves. You start with elliptic curve, it doesn't matter what's in an amorphous in ring, whenever you send it to FP, you get at least CM, and sometimes you get something more. And this is exactly the case of 22, and for the curve is exactly the case when it's super single. And indeed, we call this surface, the one that you attain 22, super single k free surface. So the correlation is really, the, the relation between those two objects is really strong. And so but let's go back to the point. How do I compute uh, the Picard lattice over finite fields? The lattice, I don't know yet how to compute uh, in an easy way, but I can just compute the dimension. And a way to do it is by computing the Hasselhoff zeta function. So Hasselhoff zeta function is just a generating function that gathers my number of points my, of my surface. Uh, this is a rational function indeed. And the only interesting thing is this chi t, which is a polynomial, which is uh, indeed the determinant of Frobenius acting on H2. And chi is degree 22. So if I can compute this polynomial, then I can deduce the zeta function. Uh, I didn't write it here, but also chi t because of, of the veil conjectures is going to be uh, palindromic. So indeed, there are only 11, 11 unknowns. So if I compute points up to m less or equal than 11, I have enough information. I can just do linear algebra to deduce all the coefficients of chi. So then given chi, I will be able to use the Picard number. 
And it is thanks to Pip conjecture that tells me that indeed the, the things that I know are, the, sorry, the cycles that are fixed in the Frobenius really correspond to algebraic cycles. We obviously know that algebraic cycles will be fixed in the Frobenius after a dead twist, but it's not obvious that anything that's fixed in the Frobenius should be an algebraic cycle. And that's what Pip conjecture states, which is a theorem for KF surface over finite fields. And uh, I'm not going to say anything about the proof, but here's again, like where, for example, Kuga Satake construction plays a key role. We have known the conjecture for abelian varieties uh, for many years. It was indeed proven by Tate. And uh, in maybe around 2014, 2014 is when we started to be able to prove the conjecture for k several finite fields. And if you look at all the proofs, it's more or less that there's a key ingredient, and that key ingredient is Kuga Satake. So the idea of associating an uh, K-free surface to a blue variety. Even though that blue variety is going to be horrible dimension, we can still use it to prove things about K-free surface. And here's an example. And now we should stop and think like, okay, I you gave me an algorithm to compute the the rank of the Picard lattice, but that so far all I gave you is, is quite bad. And the reason it's quite bad is because I'm suggesting you to count points for up to P to the 11. Now, I don't know which example you picked, but for example, if you picked, uh, when I give you the example of KP surface, if you picked a quartic surface or a double cover of P2, you have four variables. So uh, if you go do this naively, we'll have, you'll specialize one because it's projective, and then you have three remaining variables. So when you raise all those to 11, you get something of our P to 33. So it becomes impractical very fast. Indeed, I don't know any uh, algorithm, uh, sorry, any paper that has done this naively for P bigger, P bigger than seven. And so for larger P, one needs to rely on uh, much more advanced methods. And basically one relies on the infrastructure of methods in crystalline cohomology. So I'll say two words about that because we'll, this will play an important role later on is that the idea here is that we can try to compute this from minus matrix, at least an approximation of it periodically using piadic commotion. And then based on that, not only we have the matrix, but you can also do sky. And as you can see, uh, several people, including I have been working on this in the last couple of years. And this is what really allows us to, for example, do numerical experiments, which will play a, a role later on. Okay, but maybe you don't care about finite fields, but you will have to care about finite fields, but let's go to Q bar, which is perhaps where you like to live. So, the computation in Q bar is in principle solved, as in the same way that perhaps over finite fields is. If I can find the cycles, I can just loop over all the cycles. And there are various people who work on this problem. So I'll start uh, by, by the end. So I'll start, for example, telling what Larry and Sertus do. They don't give us an algorithm, they give us a numerical method, which is via the computation of the period. They compute the period with the uh, ball arithmetic. And once you have the period of, the, of a cable surface, you can do a uh, lot of reduction. So you try and find short vectors and see which ones, in, in what way these things add up to zero. And then you get, you find some small relations and some relations are of too large uh, uh, coefficients. So you ignore those and that gives you the Picard number. Probably it's not a proof, but it's a very good way to have a good guess before you move along. Um, Shioda also gave us some, uh, or better taught us in many ways how to compute the Picard number in various cases. For example, when if a Mike free surface is like elliptic vibration or I'll get distracted by the, by the chat. Um, or for example, if my k free surface is automorphism group. So that's another reason why you would like to compute automorphism groups because knowing that the automorphism group increases your lower bound on the Picard number, but sometimes knowing it exactly on the nose will help you to compute the Picard number. Uh, then there's asset crush and chinkle. Uh, so the idea here is that you pick a k surface, you compute this Kuga Satake, and then you compute a number of algebra there, then to get your uh, narrow severity group there, and then to relate it back to the Picard lattice on a k surface. Now, here you should stop and think because indeed, if I could compute the Kuga Satake and compute a number of algebra, my, my million variety can be of a dimension very large, to the 19. So there's not really a practical way to do that yet, or to compute an algebra on large, uh, 
of a billion varieties of large dimension. Uh, Poonen, Testa, and Van Loeck give us different methods. They assume, um, they assume and show that et al. homology is computable. And based on that, they can compute the Frobenius matrix in, in some ways. Or sorry, let me not say that. They can compute the Picard number in the Picard lattice. But they assume that this assumption, which they prove that's true about uh, et al. homology being computable, assume that you can write a program uh, and put it on a computer to compete with et al. homology. Even though there's such a program, no one has done it yet. And we don't know yet how to do that in a practical manner. And for last, there's Charles, which uh, gives us a better understanding what kind of Picard numbers can, what's the relationship between Picard numbers over Q bar and FP bar, but still relies on searching for explicit cycles. So these algorithms are in many ways not practical or better. The early ones, sorry, the ones I, I are in the beginning are not practical because in the end of the day you need to search for explicit cycles. And the uh, later one, for example, is a numerical one. So it gives you the right guess, but does not give you proof that you have the right Picard number. So in the end of the day, even though we have an algorithm to do it, we don't know how to do that efficiently. Uh, but usually the key role that plays to determine such a search that you basically trying to search about uh, you're trying to search cycles and then you want to say like, oh, I stopped, I found all the possible cycles. It's you're trying to use the relation to finite fields. Uh, this relation can be even more complicated, but let me just say the simplest way possible that we have the specialization, the specialization map from the Picard group of Q bar to FP bar is injected. So this gives, this gives us a, a very easy inequality that the Picard number of over Q bar is always smaller equal than the Picard number of P bar and the prime of good reduction. So if you believe that our Picard number is small, or if you can find a, a small number of generators for Picard, uh, sorry, PQ bar, then by competing some reduction and competing the Picard number of P bar, I'll hope to find the, to match the inequality, or I have some reason to believe that this inequality is strict. So there are various ad hoc methods to improve this in the inequality. And now I'm going to tell you both about in a next slides, but now I think it's perhaps a good time to ask for more questions before I become more technical. So if you have questions, shoot away. Okay, uh, Tamar tell, tells me that uh, the tech project for non-super single case was, was, was proven earlier by Niels Nagard, ordinary case by Nagard Gogos, quasi ordinary case. Thank you for information. I was not aware of that. Need I, I, I need to be honest. I never look into the proofs very, very carefully. But what, what we need to say is that even though that conjectures were known for billion varieties, it took, it took many people to be able to prove them for KP surface, even though we're using this Kugus attacker construction all the way. Edgar, maybe you could, um, this is Rachel, just say a little bit about you know how you're doing the computations, like what, you know, what programs and and um, somehow whether, you know, how you know when you fi have found the generators for the Picard lattice and. Yeah, so uh, uh, um, that that's a very tricky subject. It's very hard to know and I'll tell you more about it in a bit. But um, so I claim here that and perhaps too rough of me that we don't know how to officially find such generators. And I really recommend um, Dino Festi uh, paper. I think it's called Competing Picard Lattice of KFS Service of Degree 2, I believe. I don't remember exactly what's the final title of that paper, but it gives you very practical approaches to try to find such generators and how to know that indeed you found the, you found the right lattice, not just a sub lattice. But in the end of the day, the big question is exactly how do you know when to stop? Because I give an inequality and there might be very good reasons for this inequality to be strict, for example. And for example, if you remember, the right-hand side is always even, that's right-hand side, and the left-hand side can be odd. So there's no reason for you ever to hope to have get a, a sharp inequality. So that's why I'm gonna tell you now about various ad hoc methods that help us to get some information from finite fields and bring it back to Q bar. 
Um, yeah, this, this question, these can be quite difficult. One can, const I have examples of things like an elliptic K3 surface over Q that has more Delve rank one, but the generator has height 163 over two. You can probably guess where that comes from. And I have found the generator, but it, you know, it has literally like thousands of digits for all the coefficients. And if you didn't know where the surface came from, I, I doubt that you'd be able to do it with generic methods, but maybe I, if maybe you can by now. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. So maybe, maybe this an example I forgot to say mm -hmm. later on, uh, earlier on is that uh, I'm quite sure that most people are aware of the elliptic curve records being 28. And Noam is the, the one who found it. And the question you should ask yourself, how did he find it? And the first thing, or it's a, I think it's a common method by now is that first you try to find a, a K3 surface with a elliptic vibration where that this elliptic surface has high model of rank. And in this case, like you, there's this relation, like you can think about how do I know about the Picard lattice? It's the same way like somewhat, how do I know about the model of a rank? And in this case, they, they are correlated and Somewhat the difficulty of that problem of, of producing, for example, K preserver with high model of rank, which are related to the Picard lattice, is somewhat related to the difficulty of finding elliptic curves with high rank. Obviously, I need to be precise that he found uh, elliptic uh, surface with model of rank 18. I hope I'm not wrong. And yes, then it's it about like trying to find the right specialization that achieves high rank. But I think Noam already talked about that. A couple of months ago, so oh, sorry. So rank seventeen over k, over q. Yeah. You know, now I'll tell you a bit more how to know when to stop. Even though, like, the key the key point here is that we we have theorems that say like if you do this by day and by night, you compute the Picard lattice. However, those theorems, if you run them, you will, the the universe will, will explode and will be done and will not not yet found all the generators if the if the Picard lattice is not trivial. But for example, for Picard lattice being trivial, should be able to prove that that's the that's the case. So let me just try to give us an understanding how to improve this upper bound, which will help us to know when to stop. Because by improving the upper bound, we'll improve our understanding like when to stop searching for generators over Q bar. So the first uh, ad hoc method, which I know of, I'm sure there are others before this, but this one is quite uh, striking because it's so simple, but still like only like like maybe 13 years ago was was discovered was the idea of using two primes. So you have your Picard surface over, over uh, sorry K3 surface over Q bar, and you spe specialize two primes such that the Picard number over, over FP bar and FQ bar is the same, so two R, and then by some methods, which also relies on on that conjecture. It's called Artin Tate conjecture. You can show that the discriminants cannot cannot be equal because the Artin Tate conjecture tells you discriminant up to squares. So by just using these two lovely equations, you can conclude that the the Picard rank over Q bar cannot have to cannot be ranked to R. So less, therefore, like now the inequality becomes strict. And uh, Van Lock used these methods to prove. The first known algebraic, uh, sorry, example over Q, which we know that uh, the geometric Picard rank is one. So even though we knew that the generic case had to be one, so basically I gave you a random K3 surface to you, and I asked you what's the Picard rank, it could most likely could bet your house on it and say like Picard rank is one. But so until then we didn't know a way to prove it. So this was the the first way that we knew how to prove that Picard rank is one. Um, Anyhow, this also still requires luck because Van Lueck uses this in case of R equals one. So this uh, second equality becomes less equal than two. And we know this always at least one. So that gives you a very limitation, but there's no reason why to expect uh, these two numbers to differ just by one. And I'll tell you more about that later. Yeah, okay, Poon is pointing out, um, Bjorn is pointing out that uh, well, he was the first one to write down explicit examples, but we knew that they existed. Yes, I agree with that. But for me, like I need to see equations. Okay, so 
another method to try to improve that inequality is trying to study better the, sp the specialization map. And what Elsa and Daniela did is that they showed that uh, the specialization map has torsion free co-kernel, which let's make it simple. It just means that if you assume that the ranks over FP bar and Q bar are the same, then every invertible shift lifts. So let's just go over an example, or better, theoretical example is that uh, you have over FP bar, the rank is two. So first, what they will do, they compute a Picard lattice over FP bar. Note, this can be easy or can be very hard because yes, FP bar makes it a lot easier because you're now dealing with finite fields, but the Picard lattice can still be quite ugly. So there's no reason for you to succeed at this step. After you have the generators, you can try to estimate the degree of the, uh, of the hypothetical effective divisor of the lift. And now you have the bound on the degree. You can just run the Grobner basis to verify that your device lifts or does not lift. So they managed to use this for uh, k free surface, which are a double cover of P2, and also managed to put there the first explicit example of rank one. Now, one needs to be very clear that this approach is only practical if you understand very well the geometry of your example. Because first, competing the Picard uh, lattice over FP bar is not trivial. And you can also obtain estimates that are not low enough. So you need to really massage things perfectly to be able to apply this method. And Elsa and Daniel are great at this and they managed to succeed. Now I'm going to provide you a, a more different method. It's like a method without geometry. This is a joint work with Certus. And the idea is to compute the periodic approximation of the obstruction map. Um, this is a bit more overwhelming theory, but I'm going to try to make it simple. So first of all, if you don't know what crystalline cohomology is, just replace this by the RUM cohomology or a tall cohomology. In the end, like uh, the theory doesn't really matter, or it matters, but make use whatever is more comfortable to you to get the idea. So the idea is that I can there's a map that goes from peak to H2 quotient by the first file iteration. So what this tells me is that uh, in this case, that if I have a, if I have a curve in, in, in peak, and if under this map, I don't get zero, then I, I know that this curve cannot lift to curve six zero. So this is very analogous of saying that over Q bar or over C, my Picard left is intersection of H11 with H2. It's the same thing. So if you know we have a class and you see that does not land in H11, you'll be like, oh, it is not really a class. It cannot be algebraic class. So here's the same thing, but not periodically. And the best thing here is that even though this has some geometric reasons, I can ignore geometry completely. And I can teach a computer how to compute an approximation of this periodic map. So I compute the periodic approximation of this map. And the way it goes is first, I, I start by competing the approximation for minus. I need to do this no matter what, to compute just the rank over FP bar because that's indeed for a higher P, that's the only way I know how to compute the Picard numbers over FP bar. Once I have the Frobenius matrix or periodic approximation to it, I can compute a periodic approximation of my Picard lets, but now as a QP vector space, that's sad. It, it's, it's quite hurts us quite a lot that we need to go from a lattice to a vector space, but let's ignore it for the moment. And then given the, the vector space, nothing stops me to compute the projection down to uh, H2 over the first filtration, which in the case we're doing, it just ends up being just a projection to a coordinate. And in this case, then I conclude that my, my dimension of a Picard lattice over curve six zero is going to be less or equal than the dimension of this kernel of this map. So this only might improve your, only your upper bound by one, but by using other clever tricks that showed up previously in literature, we can improve this method much more. But the key idea here is that you should think about the previous ideas from Van Loeck and Nassanianas, but now we're basically removing the geometry and be able to teach this to computer, just do it on the fly. And we wrote a paper about it to show like how practical it is and how we can just use this to get really sharp upper bounds. So in the, in the end of the day, you can use this to, to get really sharp upper bounds, which is new, is one prime. And so this allows to get some confidence that when you found gener enough generators that you can stop. Okay, but perhaps uh, 
you're not enjoying that so much this uh, periodic geometry. So another way you can do, which is more hands-on, is try to compute the Picard number over satellite moments. So I'll not define what satellite group is. The definition is here on my slides, but let's ignore it for the moment. But the key part is that the dimension of my Picard lattice, if the satellite conjecture is true, can be computed as a limit of the average of the traces. So in here, I need to normalize my trace. So I need to divide by P. So if I compute the average of the traces, then these are going to give me the, the Picard lattice. So if you have a way uh, to compute many traces, for example, up to a million, then you can just run this algorithm and again get a good guess of your Picard lattice over the base field. Not a proof. We don't, we don't have any good up, uh, upper bounds on like how fast this converges. So you cannot go write in a paper that you've gets the number. But in the world of first try and then see what you get, this is a, a good start. Um, as Charles mentioned that this also can be done for a billion varieties and more in general. You need the, the way you prove the theorem is for billion varieties, but here everything holds the same. Okay, now I think there's a good time to stop if uh, anyone has any questions because I'll switch gears again. Yes, uh, this, is, this is very sensible to the, to the base field. Sorry, I need to repeat the question for the people that will see this later on YouTube. So do I need, uh, uh, Jeff Hacker asks, for this work, do we need to be over a big enough field to see the geometric Picard? Yes. So this is very much like satellite for genus two or, or, or genus one even simpler. Like the subject group is very sensible to the field of definition or, or in the field of definition of your endomorphism. So here's exactly like the same. You only want to see the geometric card number if you base change or if you only consider primes that are totally split on the field of definition of your Picard lattice. So this also allows on the, on the end to understand better what's, when do your extra cycles start to show up? Because you can, can for example, uh, see that uh, a KP server might be Picard rank one over Q and only acquire uh, more cycles and over higher and higher extensions. Mm. And the satellite group is connected. It's only connected after that base change. So when you base change to the field of definition of Picard lattice, then it's going to be connected. Any more questions? Hello, Edgar. <laughs> Um, what is that question mark again between the, the question, equalities? The question mark is just, we don't know a conjecture for KFIR service. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And uh, let me make a side remark. You mentioned in the very beginning that the neuron severity of a K3 surface plays a role similar to the role played by the endomorphism algebra of an abelian variety. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me respectfully disagree. Actually, in my humble opinion, an analog of the endomorphism algebra of, of 4K3 surface, it's not neuron severe, but rather the endomorphism algebra of its or, or of the corresponding transcendental Q of the corresponding transcendental lattice viewed, uh, viewed, as a Hodge, viewed as a Hodge structure. And in a sense, it's even better. Because in the case of abelian varieties, you have various, uh, say, endomorphism algebras. But in the case of K3 surface, you are getting only, only a field, either CM or totally real. And well, uh, certainly in general, in, in general case, you get just Q uh, or Z, respectively. However, as Hans and Janel provided examples of non-trivial endomorphism algebras, there are explicit examples. And let me just finish this uh, side remark by by, uh, uh, by mentioning the, that, the, that, that the Mumford Tate group of K3 surface is uniquely determined by its endomorphism algebra, contrary to the case of abelian varieties. Thank you very much for the lovely remark. I, I, I fully agree with you that the endomorphism algebra of the odd structure is much more interesting and plays a very similar role to endomorphism algebra, but to even talk about that, first we need to talk about the Picard lattice. That's, that's why I prefer see like as a first level Picard lattice and second level the endomorphism algebra of Priscilla lattice. Uh, sure, but if you want to look at SATA Tate group of a K3 surface, I guess uh, you should look at this endomorphism algebra as well. I fully agree. Okay, but I'm, I'm moving along because I'm getting tight on time. Uh, 
Okay, so so far I've been trying to we have been trying to improve the inequality of that the Picard number of Q bar is less than or equal to Picard number of P bar. So one question: Can we use this inequality for our, to our advantage? And the answer is yes. Uh, Lee and Lietk uh, show that if you get this, make the inequality strict for infinitely many primes, and it doesn't contain the maximum value for all those primes, then it, your uh, K-free server of Q bar will have infinitely many rational curves. And we can now then use a, a, a result of Baumol and Zarin that tells that indeed we cannot hit the maximum number that often. Basically, the same thing as elliptic curves. He, your elliptic curve might, might cannot be super single for every prime. That's the basic idea. That will be quite odd. So using these uh, two results, they show that if your Picard number is odd, then your sorry algebraic geometric Picard number is odd, then your k free will contain infinitely many rational curves. So can we study this? Can we understand better when this inequality occurs? And the answer is yes. Uh, first of all, we need to tell about a theorem of Charles that tells us that that, that inequality is a bit more complicated than we imagine. So there's an invariant, which I'm going to put in the middle and not mention what it is, it's eta. Something to do with what Tamar was telling us about. But the key part here is that that's an invariant. It's bigger equal than zero. And that the quality of this inequality occurs infinitely often. And after the, uh, a base change, it will need, it need occur with density one. Nonetheless, I can still ask myself, when does that inequality occur? Like, sorry, when does the inequality strict? Like, is this set infinite and what is density? Um, so I'm asking about density, I'm basically asking about this limit. How many primes are in my pi jump set? Uh, in proportion to all the primes up to that bound. So let's go for Coomer surface, um, which is an example where I can explain this better. So for Coomer surface, um, the Picard number of the k surface was the Picard number of the my Buon surface, and it's just shifted by 16. You can think about the 16 coming from the 16 singularities that you produce when you did the quotient. Um, the same thing over FP bar. And the eta is just a, a parity of my Picard number. So everything is as before. So with simplest case, nothing new has showed up so far. So I can just say my pi jump of my Kiffy service need my pi jump of A. So, and as before, and now I write P, you should think about uh, my Picard lattice uh, or my narrow survey group as being related to my n homogeneous algebra of my middle variety. So in this case, I can stop and think. For example, when can my Picard number of a, a beyond surface be bigger or equal than four? And then that happens if and only if my abelian surface is isogenous to a square of elliptic curve over, over FP bar. Okay, and what happens when it's six? Then that's if and only if is all is a square and is also super singular. So very much what we expected before. So now I can just work down what does it mean to be a prime being my pi jump set. And if I start with a, a, a Bion surface that's um, a square of elliptic curve, then this is going to have my, my prime is going to be pi jump, even only if my prime is super singular. And this is basically the Lang product conjecture, which basically tells that the P should be super singular probability proportional to one of square of P. And indeed, Alex has shown us that there are infinitely many super singular primes for E over Q. And because I'm running out of time, I can tell that there are other two things we could consider about, for example, A, probability curves, or A generic. And I'll leave this for the exercise. My slides are available, but I just get to the upshot as fast as I can. And the upshot is like, let's do some numerical experiments and see what happens for a generic free surface. So rank one. And if you do that, what you observe, so here on the bottom is the, the upper bound on B, sorry, the upper bound on primes. and on the y-axis proportion, I pick two generic free surface and observe some odd behavior. So I get something very similar to Lang Trotter. So if you do some reverse engineering, you can see that gamma seems to behave as some constant of square root of b. And again, you do reverse engineering. This basically means that the probability of p being pi jump is one over square root of p. And okay, that's odd. What about let's try a more complicated example? So let's go now to 
to Picard rank two. And now I get totally different behavior. So now I'm not plotting things in long log plot anymore. And what happens here is that now my y axis started at 0.5. So it looks like my density is always above 0.5, which is quite odd. So at first, I'll say there's an obvious trend. And I one kind of wonder, like, can this be related to some integer being a square model P? And indeed, when I, I first wrote the first version of archive of this paper, I said no, because I would expect this to cross the 0 0.5 barrier infinitely often. So it's quite odd that I go all the way to 60,000 and I don't see any crossing. I also search for small number fields to explain this behavior, and I could not find a reason. And in the end, I was wrong. And the reality is that indeed, indeed there's something to do with some quadratic extension. Indeed, there's a number, which I'll call the screen of my k surface, which is the discriminant represents the quadratic character of my determined representation on all the transcendental lattice. And the inert primes on this quadratic extension will always be inside of pi jump. So if my D is not a square, then I just produce a set of this at least one half inside of pi jump. So with these, we get a corollary that basically tells that this is one half if it is not a square and my k phase server will have infinitely many rational curves. And the reason why I fail trying to find the right uh, quadratic extension in the beginning is because these numbers are quite large. So here are the examples of uh, the number of the first three examples. And the key part is that these numbers keep going for quite a long time. So that's why it's, the behavior is so off what we'll expect about quadratic extensions. And I know I two minutes over time, so I'll finish in the next one minute. Now, next thing you could ask yourself, I understand the, uh, this one half behavior. What if I take away this one half behavior? So the way you do that is by do a base change by making these primes in it irrelevant. So if I ignore this one half behavior, what do I get by basically the base change? Oh, get again the same exact plot as I got for Picard rank one. So again, this log log plot. So again, this is behaving as some constant over the skirt of B. So in the end, for geometric Picard number for Picard number two, the behavior seems to be without a reason yet that if you're if D is not a square model P, then you for sure in pi jump. And if you're not, then still your probability of mean pi jump is about one of squared of P. Um, and I also need to say that I give you the example about Picard rank one, Picard rank two, and this example, this, this is not about one and two, it's about parity. And I need, I observe these many examples. We also can construct examples where the x is square and therefore we don't, you observe these behaviors from, from, from the beginning. Okay, I'll stop here so people can go to all their business and I'll answer questions uh, in a bit.